And greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. I am Steve Dace, Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. They're here with me as well. 888-900-3393 is the number. 888-900-3393. You can also feel free to join us via the SteveDace.com inbox. Steve at SteveDace.com is how you can email us. That's D-E-A-C-E. You can like us on Facebook. Whoa, sorry about that. Air bubble. You can try liking us on Facebook. at a Rick Majerus moment there. Uh, you can try liking us on Facebook, although Facebook is giving us likes right now. Granted, it's probably like one out of ten for every like we're getting is being acknowledged because somehow I can grow by almost 5,000 followers on Twitter in two weeks and a much larger platform that mo far more Americans access like Facebook says we've grown by like 200. That ratio doesn't seem legit to me. Does that seem legit to you, Erzin? Assume you're being lied to. Yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. Presented by President Fauci, uh, Fauci over there. Yes, thank you. Um, but, but hey, Two weeks ago, we were getting zero for 10. So we're getting about one or one and a half out of 10. So please keep trying to penetrate the shadow ban on Facebook. You can also, we mentioned Twitter, follow us there for now. Anyway, at Steve Dace Show. And if you're looking for clips of this show that you can sample or share with others, go to youtube.com slash Steve Dace. It is a rare day today here on this show, but... These are rare times. It is not often we have two guests in one program. But today we do. Congressman Thomas Massey, newly anointed traitor to the Republic, will be joining us to explain his nefarious actions coming up here at the bottom of the hour. He dared demand Congress actually record a vote individually. Everyone go on the record about the largest spending bill in all of human history. We will force him to explain his actions coming up here at the bottom of the hour. And then next hour, a story that uh, continues to develop and break. I've got some updated context to that story right now on my Facebook page. But the pastor in Tampa who was arrested for violating that city's shelter-in-place order, his attorney, Matt Staber, I've known Matt for years. He's been on this show several times over the years. He is with Liberty Council. He will be joining us here uh, during, what, about an hour and a half from now. Uh, between that, some fake news or not, and Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Going to Jail. The following clip is from this show on March 20th. True or false, we will eventually see a pastor arrested for holding a church service in violation of coronavirus precautions. Todd. True. I don't know. I don't know how many would be willing to defy it, number one. I mean, if, if, you know, if you're Bishop Morton, and if, if you're in a state like Georgia and you, you want to ever win public office again and you arrest a pastor for having a church service. But it's not going to be like this guy. He's not going to be respected. It's going to be somebody that's Some easy to caricature yeah. and make fun Fred of everybody. Phelps. Fred Phelps. It's going to be like that. Because there's another angle to this that I don't have time to get into in depth, but our charismatic and Pentecostal brothers are going to be like, I thought healing was part of the ministry of the gospel. So we're going to tell people at a time that there's a, there's a pandemic. Don't, don't come and have hands laid on you. Don't have people pray for you. You know, don't, don't have the ministry of the saints, uh, you know, from a healing perspective and ask for God to intervene that we're going to do that now. Lo and behold, the Pentecostal pastor and a frequent floater of conspiracy theories, Rodney Howard Brown of the River Church in Tampa Bay was arrested yesterday for holding a quote unquote unlawful assembly. Hillsborough County Sheriff Chad Conister explained why. Last night I made a decision to seek an arrest warrant for the pastor of a local church who intentionally and repeatedly chose to disregard the orders set in place by our president, our governor, the CDC, and the Hillsborough County Emergency Policy Group. His reckless disregard for human life put hundreds of people in his congregation at risk and thousands of residents who may interact with them this week 
in danger. The Religious Liberty Law Group Liberty Council has already volunteered to represent Howard Brown, and it's their contention, amongst other things. The church enforced a six-foot distance between family groups in the auditorium. All staff wore gloves. Every person who entered the church received hand sanitizer, and the floor in the lobby was specifically marked with six-foot distancing markers. Meanwhile, in other news, two federal judges have ruled that planned parenthood locations in Texas and Ohio must keep killing babies during the Wuhan coronavirus pandemic. Both states had previously ruled Planned Parenthood was not an essential service. Pennsylvania had previously placed a ban on elective surgeries, but now has carved out an exception for Planned Parenthood to provide an avenue for baby killing. Moving on, Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy, has shifted his production from pillows to medical face masks and is hoping to produce 50,000 masks a day by the end of the week. He spoke about his efforts at the White House yesterday, and leftist journalists spent the rest of the day freaking out after he said this. And I encourage you to use this time at home to get to home to get back in the Word, read our Bibles, and spend time with our families. Yesterday, the state of Virginia announced it's implementing a stay-at-home order through June 10th. Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner begged criminals to stop committing crimes. Criminals, take a break. Okay, stay home. Okay, stay home and don't commit any crimes. And that way, they'll stay safe and out of jail. And police officers will stay safe and can go home to their families, okay? So everybody chill. Crooks, criminals, you chill. Wait till the coronavirus is over. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan has enacted stay-at-home orders for his state's residents as well. Violators will be subject to one year in jail and a $500 fine. At least eight registered sex offenders have been released from an upstate New York jail as part of the effort to stop the spread of coronavirus. Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser stated yesterday that D.C. residents must stay at home unless it's on essential business. Violators will be fined up to $5,000. Nearly 165,000 Americans have tested positive for the Wuhan coronavirus with 3,170 deaths. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's montage brought to you by Riduzone. All right, reality check. Uh, you fell off the wagon with that New Year's resolution, and now you're thinking more than ever before, given what's going on. I've got to get control of my health, particularly when it comes to eating right and losing weight. Here's the problem, though. While you're more aware of it probably right now, you also got more downtime than you ever had before. Right? Sitting around, you're bored. What are we going to do? Start packing on the pounds. How do you get those cravings and those portion sizes? How do you get them under control? Well, that's where Riduzone uh, can be a help for you right there. It's the only FDA-accepted product that includes OEA. That is the naturally occurring molecule that helps you feel full faster to keep those portion sizes and those cravings under control. All right? So if you want to give Riduzone a try, you can only get it on their website at Riduzone.com. That's R-I-D-U. Z-O-N-E for Riduzone.com. That's the only place where you can get it. And if you use my name, Steve, as a promo code right now, you can get up to 65% off with free shipping thrown in. That's a heck of a deal. 65% off with free shipping as well. When you go to Riduzone.com, R-I-D-U-Z-O-N-E, R-I-D-U-Z-O-N-E, Riduzone.com, promo code Steve. So let's get to um, some of Aaron's montage. And, I, and before I get to the, the specifics, I, I want to peel the curtain back for you from a big picture perspective. Because something you said yesterday, Todd, uh, I thought of it first thing when I got up this morning and decided to do some research. And one of the things you said on the show yesterday is that um, in your exurbian uh, district out there in Carlisle, Iowa, you guys are contemplating, uh, you know, as a district, are we going to move spring sports back to summer, you know, when there's more heat, uh, more sun, vitamin D, that's typically when viruses get burnt off. We saw that with the first SARS, right? And you guys are having that conversation. And, and you mentioned to me and to our audience yesterday that several of the people that are in your community you're discussing this with are just under the impression we just can't do anything until next year when we get a vaccine, right? Was that, yeah. am, I, am I quoting you properly? Absolutely. Okay. If you're waiting on that, if that is your game plan, 
stop hoarding toilet paper and buy up all the Snickers because you are going to be here for a while. You're not going anywhere for a while. I, I think Americans, again, part of this is the spirit of the age we're in. This progressive notion that utopian solutions can always be had. That, that east of Eden, life is not a series of trade-offs. Of, uh, the law of unintended consequences can be repealed because, well, we got a federal judge to do that for us. That somehow we exist outside the laws of nature and nature's God. The reality is none of that is true. And, and we have done terrible things to our way of life before this point acting otherwise, putting ourselves trillions of dollars in debt for a welfare state, believing we could completely eradicate things like illiteracy, completely eradicate things like poverty. And we ignored the law of unintended consequences, crafted solutions that thought we could just make these things zero-based, and exploded things like the out-of-wedlock birth rate instead. So it's six and one half dozen of the other. We just shifted the societal cost from one burden to another. And that's because progressivism by nature is primarily concerned with the outcome. The Judeo-Christian worldview is concerned with the premise. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Says in the Old Testament, serve God or serve Baal. In other words, what's the premise of your life? Whom, whom are you living this for? What are, you in, what are you living for, obeying? What's the premise of your life, the purpose of it? Ours is to obey, outcomes are for God. That's I've, right. I remember you coining, I think you coined it. As, Actually, as I stole much, it from John Quincy Adams. Well, as much as anything from listening to you for a long time before <laughs> yes. I worked for you, I remember that. Yes, I mean, the, 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 when Jesus looks at the, at the rich young ruler, go home, sell off everything you own, come and follow me. In other words, what's the point of your life? What, what is, why are you here? What's the end game to this? The, the, the biblical worldview says that death has been conquered, but it has not been erased. We are all going to die. It's just a matter of whether or not the grave, the, whether or not death gets the final word. And it doesn't. Progressivism ignores all of this. Ignores it all. And it starts instead of what is the premise of our actions. Whom are we serving? Whom do we worship? Why are we trying to do what we're trying to do? What, what's motivating this? Progressivism launches itself directly to the outcome. Hey, we've got to get rid of poverty. That's the outcome. And then let's craft solutions, re reverse engineer solutions from there, never anticipating what happens with the law of unintended consequences. That doesn't mean trying to eradicate poverty is not a worthy goal. That's not what it means. But starting it from the, the notion that ye be like God, that I can, I can fashion a utopia. A lot of the worst tyranny in this world over the last couple of centuries has come from that notion that we can create utopias. And then that progressive notion is perfectly fine with making those whom do not agree with that assertion suffer in order to achieve it. And what's happening right now, I believe, in the culture is that a lot of Americans, because they, they are, maybe the word I'll use here is estranged. They are estranged from their creator. They have talked a very good game. I mean, the amount of Americans who are outright God haters is actually very small. But I think there's been a lot of Americans who are God deniers functional atheists. God is there to invoke when there's a certain sentiment to be had, but is not really an integral part of my life or directing the choices I make until I make bad choices. And then I ask him to come like some kind of mob cleaner, like the Harvey Keitel character in Pulp Fiction. We make a bunch of bad choices and God is the one who comes and he's the cleaner. He cleans them up for us. And I think what's, what's driving a lot of this panic is twofold. One, I think never before as a people have we been more afraid of our mortality. 
We're not, we know, we, we know, many of us know we're not ready to meet our maker. And we're deathly afraid of that, pardon the pun. And then there's this utopian urge that we can contrive a perfect scenario. And I think that's what's driving people to say things. Because it's not just your school district. I see this. I see this on my feed constantly. Yeah. I, I, I see this assertion everywhere. Just hunker down and wait out a vaccine. Do you even, do you even vaccine, bro? Do you know the history of vaccines? So I thought about that this morning and decided I was going to do some research. Because one of the things I told you from the research I found was that they probably have some, some combination in a lab right now that pushes back on coronavirus, SARS-2. But the question is, what happens when they inject it into human beings? Do we, does it bring something worse? Or do we shift one health burden to another? And to find out takes 12 to 18 months minimum for trial. But let's talk about polio. Probably the worst viral, the worst viral infection this country's ever faced in its history. The first polio vaccines were administered to the, uh, the first trials of those. Uh, and the military was was often used as the guinea pigs for that. Was was 1935, I believe, is when I, is when those began. It would be almost 20 more years before Jonas Salk thought that it was safe enough that he would inject it into his own family in order to prove to the American people that they could they could handle this, not to be afraid of it. 1952 is when Jonas Salk and and in uh injected his own family with the with this polio vaccine that's almost 20 years several vaccines were tried used some were used on the military going into world war ii some kind of worked, some didn't work some failed outright but for a couple of generations hundreds of thousands of, of americans died of polio or were paralyzed including scores of children now, those generations were not perfect either. They, 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 had, they had sin in their lives and in the culture at the same time. But they were also not as secularized as we are today. So they understood that mortality is baked into the cake of life east of Eden. The death rate remains 100%. And so they endeavor that as best as we can Sometimes there were quarantines of communities with massive polio outbreaks. But as best as they could, they had to, you know, um, still industrialize society, win not one, but two world wars, beat a Great Depression. I mean, you, you know, um, the, the president who rallied this nation in the days after 9 11, or after Freudian slip, the days after Pearl Harbor, did so from a wheelchair stricken by polio. They, they, they understood that they could not just shut down all of society. It would be beneath them to do so, yes. Steve. Yeah, they, they, they understood that they, they, they just, they came out of, you understand their parents and grandparents settled the Western Prairie. Fought the War of 1812 when the Brits burnt Washington, D.C. to the ground and almost ended America right there. They heard these kinds of stories growing up. So they understood that it was just passed on to them. The expectation was that if America was going to be an exceptional country, we were going to have to let the medical community do what it does, and the community was going to have to do what it does. And there would be times that those things would have to take a step back because of the medical necessity. But the idea that you would just wholesale and definitely shut down society. Progress with a small P would stop. The assembly lines would, Henry Ford's assembly lines would just stop in mass because of a polio outbreak was a foreign concept that would have never even entertained their bloodstream. Let alone the zeitgeist. Just, just everyone in America sit at home and do nothing. I mean, they looked at each other like, are you kidding me? It's America. We don't do that. We got a manifest destiny and everything else going on here. 
How about the first SARS? I told you yesterday, they, they, they never developed a vaccine. That's pertinent to this because coronavirus is from the same family of viruses as SARS-1. It's really SARS-2, just the more vicious killer. They spent years trying to find a vaccine for it with all of our modern technology. And they finally just gave up because the virus had mutated and mutated in people so many different times that they couldn't possibly keep up with it anyway. So they just gave up after years of searching for a vaccine. How about the flu vaccine? I know that for a lot of us in America, this seems like a relatively new thing to go and get this right. Do you know the first flu, the flu, the first flu vaccines were actually introduced in the 1930s? Do you know how many, I, I, I had to stop reading. I couldn't count because I'm also not an epidemiologist. I had to just, I, I, so I couldn't follow it. But after I got through like a half a dozen times, we had to, re, we had to evolve the flu vaccine to catch up with all the various strains. And to just cover what, 30% of and any that, given and, and, year's well, population? They say that, they say it's got about a 30% fail rate of those who use it is what they say. All right. Currently, that's the number they give us. That about 30% of the people that use the, the current flu vaccine will still get the flu. All right. I mean, but <laughs> this idea that we're all just going to hunker down here and print money and Netflix and chill for as long as it takes to get a vaccine. History says, pull up a chair. Maybe learn a new language. Because that's the end of your society. We, we, the, it, the, the history says, like I told you yesterday, the likelihood is much higher that there will never be a vaccine than you will have one next year ready for mass consumption. The odds are much higher. That's even with all of the technological innovations we have today. Now, previous generations of America understood this. And they, they wept when their children died of polio. They wept when their grandfathers and fathers that they saw proudly working in the fields or on assembly lines were now having to been wheeled around. But it was interesting. They had an opposite instinct to the one we have. It, that actually made them think, life is even more precious than I thought. And what I do with the time that I have matters more than just blanketly having time. That, that, that it was really more important to redeem that time than to just mark it. Just to check a box. Just to check the survival rate. They recognized I could wake up tomorrow and have it. So I better do everything I possibly can. I could be the dad I could be the I could be the patriarch of the family struck down in the fields tomorrow. So it means that I better use the time that I know that I have right now today to maximize my output and responsibility for the people that have entrusted me, that love me, that I promised to, to love and care for and provide for. Gave them an opposite instinct than what it gave us. It didn't paralyze them at all. It motivated them to further action. The coronavirus SARS-2 is vicious. The fear, though, is the pestilence. The fear is the plague. And, and when you see headlines yesterday, many of the same people who demanded Pastor Brown down there in Tampa be put into handcuffs and arrested for endangering the community, couldn't wait to jump on social media and cheer that planned butcherhood remained open. That's, that's, that is some real darkness right there. Arrest the pastor, keep the abortuaries open, keep the baby killing factories open. Why didn't the mayor of Houston, why didn't he try that? Like, it's just as easy to tell the criminals to stay home. Do you know why he didn't try this before? Why, why didn't we try this before? Gentlemen, do you know why this hasn't been attempted already? If it's just that simple. Uh, our virtue signaling has been turned up to 11, Steve. Oh, it's way past 11. Brother, we, we are, 
I mean, if this was a chalkboard, we'd be on the fourth line of the quadratic equation right now of virtue signaling is where we would be. We'd have to roll in the next the next board to continue the to continue the math. That's that's wherever whatever number that is is where we are at. Look at the reaction we have to this. Hand over your freedoms, commit economic suicide, shutter the churches, leave the abortion mills open, let all the criminals out, stop you from buying more guns. Someone is speaking very loudly. Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Turn off the virtue signaling. Mute it, ignore it on your social media. And just watch the reactions that are taking place. We've now got the president and the Congress both talking about we're going to have to do trillions more. Why stop there? Why not do kajillions? I mean, if we can just print money and it's, and it, it is absolutely worth what they tell you it is. Why are they only giving you 1200 bucks? Why didn't, aren't they giving you a hundred thousand dollars? Aren't, aren't these the same arguments we've used for years on the minimum wage? If we can just artificially inseminate wages to $15 an hour, let's make it a, a true living wage then $40 an hour. Why are we stopping at $15 an hour? I can't feed a family on that. Make it forty dollars an hour, right? That's funny. That's when they'll put on the well. Don't get crazy now, Steve. Well, except now we're going to do it by the trillions instead. Exactly. The same exact arguments apply. We're learning all the wrong lessons here. All the wrong lessons. All of the impulses that we are indulging in are the wrong ones. And I mean, when I say we, I mean collectively we as a society. I'm assuming, boy, if you're putting up with this show through this process, you want to push back against this and that's why you're here. And we're going to keep fighting for you. Down to the, down to they tell me that this job is non-essential and arrest me for it. But, This is day 15. What stories are we, are we going to read about on day 20? On day 25? I mean, Aaron wants to give me credit for, uh, for joining Todd in that prediction on March 20th, but you can see me hedging. I'm like, I don't really know. My original reaction is, I don't know. Would, it be, would people really do it that fast? Here we are, 11 days later. Where are we going to be 11 days from now? And it goes to what I told you yesterday. Everything is now on the table. Everything is. Outcomes you thought you'd never see in this country are now possible. We're going to encourage neighbors to snitch on each other and everything else. When Jonah went to Nineveh and preached repentance to those people as wicked as they were, they actually repented for a time. We are faced with a pestilence and indulge all of our worst, most craven instincts instead. The virus is vicious, but the plague is what's happening to us as a people right now. We're going to talk to newly minted American trader. Congressman Thomas Massey, next. All right, let's get right to it here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. He already carries with him the ignominious title of congressman, which, of course, has its own rather hefty baggage. But now he is a newly minted traitor to the Republic as well. We are pleased to be joined by Congressman Thomas Massey. You've had quite a week, sir. How are you? Um, I'm doing great, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Nancy Pelosi called me a dangerous menace. 
And I think uh, there need to be more dangerous menaces to Nancy Pelosi's agenda in Washington, D.C. So what did you do to draw the ire of so many of those in power? I think the good news is a lot of Americans found out John Kerry is still alive. All right. So that, that's that's officially been confirmed. He, he, he turned over a rock to respond to you. Right. The president responded to you. What 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 great uh, act of treason did you commit against this republic, sir, that the entire system brought heat down upon thee? I quoted Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution to them, which says you have to show up to Congress in order to pass bills. And uh, what they were trying to do at first, they wanted to just do a unanimous consent with nobody there. And then they decided they would do a voice vote with nobody there. And I told them that you can't do that. You need at least half of Congress there. The Constitution requires a quorum. And um, they said, well, if you re- if you impose that on us on Friday, you'll delay the bill to Saturday. I say I said, it's Thursday morning. Like, go ahead and tell people to show up. I'm telling you, that's what I'm going to do. So what happened is people did show up. They came to Congress and it was important that they did. And uh, the bill passed on time. A lot of people say that I delayed the bill or that that was my tactic. No, I wanted a recorded vote and I wanted people to follow the Constitution. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a recorded vote because they denied me one. This is the first time in the seven and a half years I've been in Congress that they have ever refused to take a recorded vote at the request of a member. But they did that. And instead of taking the recorded vote, Nancy Pelosi forced everybody to come into the chamber and prove that there was a quorum. She could have avoided that by taking the recorded vote. And by the way, Steve, a lot of people, are, even my supporters, were at first a little apprehensive. They're saying, why would you go set yourself on fire you know, Friday knowing this bill is gonna pass? I'll tell you why I went and objected. It's because Pelosi has a plan for a fourth bill. She said that this third corona bill is just a down payment. And if we let her set the precedent that she can pass any bill she wants with nobody there, then how would you oppose the fourth bill? Mm. I actually think that I've strengthened Donald Trump's hand in terms of the negotiation with Pelosi if there should be another bill. What what is this bill? What is it? I, I, we we did a, a <laughs> thorough review of it uh, with a guest last week uh, who's kind of a uh, a conservative muckraker. Maybe maybe you've heard of him, seen his work, Phil Kirpin, and he took us through this bill and he he essentially summarized it as a couple of necessities um, that that the the economy really needs, uh, surrounded by a lot of complete and total trash. That was essentially his summation of this when we had him on last week. What what, what is this? That, that may turn out to be the largest spending bill in all of human history. Yeah, and it's the biggest wealth transfer from the lower and middle class to the super rich in all of human history. Look, the, the one family could expect if they get two checks for themselves and two checks for their kids, a family might expect to get $3,000 if they qualify. The problem is this spending bill enables $6 trillion of spending, borrowing, loaning, printing of money, and there's 100 million families. Take $6 trillion, divide it by 100 million families. That's $60,000 of obligations for every family, yet they're going to receive $3,000. So where does the rest of the money go? Okay, I've, I've demonstrated maybe 5% it, go, it goes to the families. 10% goes to small businesses. The rest of this bill goes to people, shareholders and bankers. And the $1,200 checks that they're talking about, that's the cheese in the trap to get everybody to sign up for central planning, to get everybody to sign up for uh, all of this wealth transfer. It's a, it's a bait and switch is what it is. What it should be, Steve, is a war on the virus. Okay, when we were bombed at Pearl Harbor, did we do an economic stimulus? No, we declared war on Japan. We need to declare war on this virus. We need to have a Manhattan Project against this virus. If, if there is a spending bill to be had, that's the spending bill that we need. Hmm. Now that you've had a chance to do the rounds, um, go back uh, and talk to your constituents there in Kentucky. What's been the reaction since emotion has subsided uh, since last Friday? I have got nothing but an outpouring of support. I will tell you on Thursday and early morning Friday, there were some of my friends who were texting me saying this isn't the hill to die on. Like we understand 
you know, you, you believe deeply in the Constitution, but don't don't harm yourself because we want to see you reelected. And then there were some people who said, just don't do it. You know, we need this bill. But by the end of the day, Friday, the people who had texted me that were saying, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what w- this bill was about. And I didn't know what your strategy is. And now I, I back you 100 percent. By the way, I've received one hundred and thirty thousand dollars of online donations since Friday. That's more than I raised in three quarters last year. Wow. I raised in three days. This, and th- the average donation is sixty dollars. That shows you what kind of support like the America just wants to know that somebody's going to fight. Unfortunately, it was just one person on Friday. Now, there were five or six people who would have voted no if it had been recorded vote. But people want to see somebody fight. And I've kicked the hornet's nest. There are 400 people in Washington, D.C. that want to see me defeated in my upcoming primary. So if somebody can help me at thomasmassey.com, please do. Please join the people who are trying to bail me out here. I'm being crushed by the establishment. I'm glad you went there next. I want to ask you about that because one of the things I've tried to educate our audience on over the years, uh, Congressman, as someone who's worked in the inside of the process, that the the whole point of this of the uh, there's two rules of American politics. Number one, you cannot attack the Republican establishment from the right. You, media won't give you a, a, a platform to do it. The, 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 that's just that the, the Republican establishment is the is is all the Overton whatever their position is. The Overton window says that's as far libertarian or conservative as we are allowed to go. Is whatever the corporatist wing of the Republican Party thinks, like Mitt Romney, for example. That, that's as far right as we could possibly challenge the left. The other is is to essentially create protection. Rack- Brackets, to not expose what a lot of its caucus really thinks on issues so that they don't really have to come out and say, well, I, I really don't mind big government. I, I, I really am OK with Planned Parenthood and things of that nature. See, I think that is the hornet's nest you kicked over there is oh. you you assaulted the protection racket there that put oh, everybody oh, on notice. I call it the incumbent protection package. It's kind of like Z-Bart on your car when you bought a new car. They, um, When you get there, Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader, and Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader, they both promise their caucuses that they will protect them. They'll protect them from transparency, from accountability. They'll make sure that they don't get challenged seriously in a primary. And, and that's why Kevin McCarthy and Nancy Pelosi locked arm in arm last week to make sure there wasn't a recorded vote. You know, if there's anything that's that's a tell in this, it's that I did get a quorum of Congress to show up. And even then, even when they had plenty of votes to pass this, they refused to go on the record. And and that's what they were doing. They're trying to protect vulnerable members of their caucus. And the sad thing is the the members of the caucus, you would think that congressmen would want to be part of the record that they I mean, that's what they were elected to do, to go right. there. Why wouldn't you vote. want to be on the record saving America from the worst attack since uh, right. 9-11, if not Pearl Harbor? I, right. I like I never understood in the Obama years, we had more people on food stamps in the population of Spain. If more government is compassion, why weren't they holding press conferences in the Rose Garden to thank the American people for having the most compassion they've ever had? Right. I mean, if this bill is that's saving right. America, why not take credit for it then? Oh, I think it's going to boomerang on them. And they they probably know that, too. This is basically what TARP was or what the Patriot Act was. It's using a crisis to do an agenda that is un-American and not constitutional. And it's going to be with us for a long time, if not forever. Some of the things that they're doing uh, here, like enriching the Federal Reserve, look, they're going to be responsible for four trillion dollars. And it's not even going to be auditable. What, what they undertake. The bill that Congress passed is $2 trillion. All told, altogether, this is a $6 trillion uh, stimulus package, and it still doesn't do what needs to be done. We need an antibody antigen test to know if you've had the disease and con- been conferred some immunity to it. We need to test every American. We need like $10 test kits that you can take before you go to work. That's the only way we're going to get this economy going again. And I want the most compassionate policy possible. I want to save the most lives possible. And the trajectory we're on right now, we're going to have more deaths from suicides and heart disease and diabetes than we ever would from the coronavirus if we stay on this ridiculous path. Congressman, well said, by the way. Uh, Final thing I wanted to ask you about. If we can just send every American $1,200, why can't we send them $100,000? Go for it. I mean, that's the that's the hundred thousand dollar question, Steve. 
Uh, and I'll tell you why, because for every dime you give to the Americans, Wall Street and the bankers are the ones writing the bill. They're going to insist on 90 cents. I knew there were answers to that question, and all of them were bad, and you gave them to us. <laughs> Congressman Thomas Massey, God bless you, man. Thank you for joining us here today. And you know what? I want our audience to know this, too. Your office hunted us down. All right. So unlike I want to, I think that's an important point for our audience to understand is unlike a lot of your other elected representatives who did not want to have to go on the record to, quote unquote, save America with this stimulus bill. Uh, the, the guy who stood up to the system is eager uh, to explain his actions and his decisions and is actively seeking out opportunities and platforms to do so. So you should probably take that into account as well uh, as you're filtering through uh, the various perspectives here on. Uh, on what uh, Congressman Massey did last week. Thank you for joining us today, sir, here on Blaze TV. Thanks for having me, Steve. I'm going to remain transparent and force it on the others. <laughs> and we need that probably now absolutely more than ever. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. God bless you. All right, let's Thank get some you. reaction. We just heard Todd, Aaron, what do you think from Congressman Massey? <laughs> just a dude. I mean, it reminds me of that uh, scene in Groundhog Day. I'm not playing by their rules anymore, which is what he's been doing from the very beginning but we need to say that now all look at all the whispering people he had in his ear on his side thomas don't do it Pay, save your ammo for an, another day if, if not now when for god's sake ask yourself what are you so-called conservatives it was always no when it really matters but, but that's always what happens. And you know what? If whatever happens tomorrow, it's going to be the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. Let, let's just be honest. Whatever conservatism is or was simply does not exist in anything but a notional framework. There is no practical body of conservatism functioning right now. It's all a veneer. I'm a severe conservative. Uh, you, they check the box and they move on to get uh, elected so they can lie to you. And Thomas Massey is having none of it. Honestly, God, if your principles don't matter now, they will never matter, you frauds. Yeah, I, I'll be I'll be honest and and say that this time last week or last week when this went down with uh, Representative Massey. I was kind of ambivalent. I got what he was doing and I, I, I liked it, but I was relatively ambivalent because at that time it looked like maybe we were going to be on the path to reopening the country. Now that we've got cover for another month of shutdowns and we're talking about an infrastructure bill, who, who knows how many trillions of dollars that may or may not be, and just more opportunities for the, the Democratic Party, which are just the icons of the spirit of the age progressivism to come down the pike. Now now that that's on the table as well, I'd give anything for a guy like Thomas Massey or five guys, if, if we could find them in, in the house to completely gum things up as much as possible. These people just, just, I mean, if, if nothing else, if nothing else, it would just be a little bit cathartic. It would just be a little bit cathartic because these people, these people who, who want to shove down, uh, shove down our throats every manner of their worldview in policy and have no accountability for it, I, I struggle not to, capital H, hate them. So anybody who gums up the works in that way, uh, more cowbell. Thank you. I want to say this too, to, um, to the broader point where the president is concerned. Um, whether you, if, if, Whether you're on the right and you reluctantly voted for this president or you enthusiastically did or you just couldn't bring yourself to understand that if if he becomes the 21st century herbert hoover it's going to take our entire movement minimum years best case scenario years to regain any credibility with the american people en masse we saw this a century ago with the first Herbert Hoover. And the wheels that were set into motion with the election of FDR, and while you absolutely ought to acknowledge what he did to lead this country in World War II, he also set the wheels into motion for the welfare state 
and for a lot of what we have been pushing back against. As long as Todd and I have been alive, and we, you know, we're, we're in our mid-40s. And if I may, Herbert Hoover, if you don't know your history, Herbert Hoover was viewed as the consummate expert yeah. when it came to this yeah. stuff. Yeah, he, he was, was a philosopher king type, basically. Uh, when it came yeah. to economic matters, yeah. yeah, so we left it to the expert. I mean, if you look at, I, I know Tony Fauci is essentially the president right now. Look at the look at how all over the place he has been these last couple of months. It's on the record. Yeah, yeah we don't need surgical masks. Now everyone should have one. Two million people are going to die. Now it might be 200,000. Before the Imperial College Gen survey, this probably isn't going to kill any yeah. more people than the flu. January 26th, he's on record on a, on a New York City uh, radio station saying this is no threat to Americans whatsoever. Yeah. That's one of our old affiliates, by the way, AM 970, The Answer, New York City. We used to be on that station when we were doing terrestrial radio. So understand if Trump gets labeled Herbert Hoover here, that's why I'm using that hashtag. I'm trying to get everybody's attention. Do you understand? Because they're all going to, for various reasons, not want him to open the country and the economy back up. The medical professionals are in a panic because they don't really know what they're dealing with. That's why they're all over the place. And the media just wants to end the Trump presidency. So the whole game here is to is to hold Trump off from opening the country back up long enough so they can then hang him with the depression that their fear and hysteria basically caused and blame it all on him. See, he's Herbert Hoover. That's why you got to vote for the new FDR. And Joe Biden or Andrew Cuomo, whoever will be the nominee, is the new FDR that will save us. Hell, they might even give a speech. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. They might even do that. And then you're looking at years, years of credibility loss. That's what happened to the right in America post Herbert Hoover. It took decades to overcome that. There's a lot at stake here. A lot. More in a moment. And greetings. Welcome back. Hour two, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. I am Steve Dace. Aaron McIntyre, Todd Erzin are here with me as well. Bottom of the hour, Matt Staver is going to be joining us from Liberty Council. He is representing the pastor in Tampa who was arrested yesterday for violating that city's shelter in place ordinance by holding his church service. And we'll get into that issue with more details coming up here at the bottom of the hour. If you like this show, uh, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a five-star review, uh, I, 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 it, right now it's kind of a strange time to like this show. It not, I mean, we're not giving you the warm fuzzies necessarily, but the kind of like in that we're we're asking questions. You know, like one of our listeners, Sue Ketchum, just sent me a note just during the last break and said, hey, are some of these counties that don't have a lot of cases, are they shutting down so they can get stimulus money? Don't we need to ask things like that? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Because if and when President Fauci, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, sees fit to let America be America again. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, by the way, I would urge all of you, especially those of you that are the most ardent supporters of President Trump, that, that want your country back, to, to bait him. You know, there's no reason we can't bait him. I mean, the left media baited him for the last month into shutting the country down, right? We all watched it happen. Yep. They baited him. Why can't we? You should bait him. I think all of us should be referring to President Fauci now. There's one thing we know the president does not like. It's other people taking his accomplishments from him or taking titles, roles, responsibility, and power that was entrusted to him upon themselves, right? We know he doesn't like that. Why can't we bait him? I think every, I think every one of us on social media ought to be referring to President Fauci. And I think, I think we ought to just send that message all the way up to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue because he is the one really running the country right now. Just my own personal opinion. But um, should, in his infinite grace, wisdom, and mercy philosopher king president fauci see fit to allow the country at any point to come back open you're then going to have another battle with governors similar to overturning roe v wade at the supreme court would be great it'd be a huge win but it's not the end of the battle the battle not just shifts to a state-by-state -state battle state-by-state state, you're going to see governors angling well hemming and hawing well i i don't i don't know i, I don't know we should we should, I mean, there is an all-out public relations war on our governor in our state of Correct. Iowa right now. Yeah. 
to get her to declare a police state. Last week, we had 100 people in the hospital in Iowa from coronavirus SARS-2. Yesterday, it was reported 51. Now, that kind of news should actually cause you to think, wow, feel optimism, right? Yeah. No. Instead, what happened is the most left-wing county in the state and our newly elected left-wing congresswoman and others saw that news and said, man, we're running out of time to, uh, to, to, to expand our power base here. If the, uh, if the hospitalization rate in Iowa sunk in half in a week, it was 100 last week, it's 51 as of yesterday. Those were the numbers we were given. 100 last week, 51 yesterday. The amount of people in Iowa hospitals because of coronavirus. And that's where the difference is. The virus isn't a scam. The approach that yes. many have to the virus is absolutely yeah, a scam. Yeah, those 51 people are still in hospitals yes. and they're suffering right now and need help and prayer. All right. And, and, the, and the medical workers that are taking on 51 more cases of a highly contagious virus that they weren't counting on taking on a few weeks ago Correct. Need, need all the support and prayer they can get as well. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the public policy. We need to re keep resetting that for you. All right. But when you see our hospitalizations in this state are cut in half in a week and your response is, that's exactly why we need a police state. Then there's something else going on here. Something, shall I say, nefarious. We're going to have our first string of 60 plus degree days in Iowa in a couple of weeks. Our hospitalizations are down by 50%. And the leftists in our state see that news and their inclination is more power. That's what they think. Unlimited power. That's what they think. I mean, I, I saw that news and thought, wow. <sighs> We're kicking ass right now here in the homestead. Nope. No, 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 no. No, that means we need a police state is what it means. So, yes, the next wave of this, when and if the president decides, the real one, the one you elected, all right, if he decides to take his power back from, from potentate Fauci, President Fauci, should the president you elect decide to take his power back from the one he just handed all of his power to, the battle will then go state to state with governors. Well, I, I don't know. In other words, this is an auction now. What is the, how much, how much free money can I get from the Fed to buy off the amount of debt I'm currently in as a governor? Because see, a lot of your states, like ours is one of them, a lot of your states have pay, or your go, pay as you go budgeting in your law. Meaning you're, by law, you cannot run operational deficits by law. Your, your, your legislative session can't end without you coming to balance. Well, someone's got to cover all the losses from your state being shut down this entire time. Just have Uncle Sam do it. Shift the burden to him. And if Mr. Trump really, boy, if Mr. Trump really wants that state, all, wants my state open in time to get the economy going for him to get reelected this fall. Well, the, the bidding starts at blank. Because I'll just go over on CNN or MSNBC. I think the president just prematurely opened this. I mean, we saw the Michigan governor do this last week. She was everywhere. The claim she made was everywhere. They, the feds told me they weren't going to help us. Okay, names or it didn't happen, right? To give me, because dude, if you heard that, I'd be fine with like, you know, um, uh, treating those people as traitors. And you know what we do to traitors, right? I, which I'm, I'd be fine. Would you be okay with that? Sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd be fine with that. I mean, I grew up in Michigan. I have a, quite the fondness for the state, in fact. Now she's like, well, you know, now she's taking that whole story back because it was a scam, man. It was a scam from the beginning. She wanted something. Maybe this. Maybe in this case, it was just publicity. She's auditioned to be Joe Biden's running mate. I don't know. But don't think there won't be several governors that will do this. Several mayors of major cities that will do this. Yes. That is why it was imperative to try to get the president to, at least in a limited basis. And when we say reopen the country, I can't speak for everyone else making the same argument we are. Here's what I'll say what we mean by this show. That doesn't mean, hey, let's hurry up and have March Madness this weekend. That's not what we're saying. That's not what we're saying. 
but but there clearly must be reasonable ways that those who have already had it and are immune, those who are not testing, uh, who show no symptoms can be put, especially you guys want all this medical manufacturing done. Who's going to do it? We can't plant respirator trees, guys. And poor Mike Lindell, I met that guy once, just the sweetest dude, man, with an incredible personal story, goes up there yesterday and says, man, this is a great time to start reading your Bibles. It was like he never said, and by the way, I stopped making the pillows that have made me a multimillionaire, and we're going to make 50,000 surgical masks instead for Amer for Team America. It was like that whole part of, that that part of the, was, the lead was just buried. Oh, I mean, another theocrat. These are the people that will insist your president never open this country back up so that they can then blame him for the depression that they forced him and helped him and made him cause. That's the game being played here. And then the rest of your governors and many of your mayors will play the exact same game for more and more free money. See, that's going to be part of the ramp up of getting our country back. There's a lag time. We needed to start that clock as fast as possible because that part of the game is going to take weeks, maybe a month. By pushing this back for an indefinite period of time, or at least another 30 days. And the good news is it works for and against us. This last time around, it worked against us, but it works for us too. The president has been known to change his mind. And I would urge all of you watching to work on changing it. Not, not, not the one who's really the president right now, but the one that you actually elected, who took the oath that has the power. Urge him to take it back. Because this Dr. Fauci has changed his position on this at least a half dozen times in the last two months. And they say Trump's material. They say Trump is random. Let's get to fake news or not. Brought to you by Home Title Lock even though we just kind of had a little fake news or not. It is shocking that your home can be stolen so easily. Deborah learned this brutal lesson when thieves found the title of her home online. Then they forged the document to appear that she sold her home, but she hadn't. And then they borrowed thousands using her home's equity. Deborah didn't even know she was a victim until foreclosure notices arrived and even an eviction notice. And she had to spend another fortune just to get her home back. This crime is known as home title fraud. The FBI calls it one of the fastest growing crime waves in the country. Your advice, should you choose to accept it, is to avoid this nightmare and protect your home with home title lock. And no, your homeowner's insurance, your bank can't protect you. Not even the banks you're bailing out right now. They, they can't protect you from this either. But for pennies a day, Home Title Lock does. First things first, find out if you're already a victim of home title fraud. Register your home at HomeTitleLock.com and enter Steve for one month of free protection. That's HomeTitleLock.com. Find out if your home has already been targeted. And then enter my name, Steve, as a promo code to get one month of free protection for your most valuable asset, your own home. All right? Particularly given the era in which we are living in right now, the amount of Americans that are going to need to dip into their home equity probably to cover some of the losses you're incurring right now, very high. Protect that investment at HomeTitleLock.com. All right, let's get to fake news or not. I have selected a few clips. And again, we're not even fact-checking the enemy propaganda. We don't fact-check left media. We don't fact-check uh, for the same... I don't fact-check CNN for the same reason I don't fact-check Russia Today. All right? I'm, I am under the impression already. I'm, I took the hint. He hate me. So I'm more interested in fact-checking the people that are supposed to be representing us. All right? And we're going to have only three clips today uh, because I think they... Uh, they perfectly encapsulate a lot of the debate that's going on right now. Two of them will be from the president and another will be from the former speaker um, who is a, who is a, an enthusiastic supporter of the president's. And I happen to work on his last presidential campaign. That's Newt Gingrich. All right. So we're going to start this one from president Trump talking about his new timeline. We're doing a lot of things and we don't want to do it too soon, but it's, you know, we're thinking that uh, around Easter, that's going to be your spike. That's going to be the highest point, we think. And then it's going to start coming down from there. That will be a day of celebration. And we just want to do it right. So we picked the end of April, uh, the last day, April 30th, as a day where 
we can see some real progress, and we, we expect to see that. And then by a little short of June, maybe June 1st, uh, we think the, uh, you know, it's a terrible thing to say, but we think the death will be at a very low number. It'll be brought down to a very low number. Todd, you get to go first. The president with a, with a, the new timeline to update the previous one we were given of the 15 days. Well, it's it's fake news because he he's the one, not somebody else. He's the one who threw out Easter, and he's also the one who who said that they were laying the groundwork by going not only state by state, county by county of the ways that we can open this thing back up again. And now he's just talking as if we're all New York City. This is fake news. It's entirely unhelpful. We are already at the place he's talking about in terms of uh, deaths and the level of impact it has on our ability to go forward and get something resembling normalcy, as Steve said, jump-started. So th this is just, his. the presentation is all fake news. Yeah, it's um, here. Here's the thing: all of the numbers, all of the models that have been thrown out since uh, basically uh, Friday evening through the weekend, especially on Sunday, especially since Sunday. I don't know exactly where they're sourced from. Now they've been telling us that 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 that's supposed to come out later today that these guidelines are supposed to come out later today with dr burks and dr Fauci. that more guidelines are supposed to come out they'll be sourcing their projections a little bit better but I, so for now it's it's fake news because two weeks ago this was two weeks 15 days to flatten the curve now it's a month to stop the spread uh mission creep much and at that point, do we even know at the end of, of April for sure? And and maybe again, I, I'll give I'll give some benefit of the doubt here to President Trump. Uh, maybe maybe that will all be spelled out. Maybe that'll all be spelled out this afternoon at, mm -hmm. at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So th this is all with that in mind, with that caveat. But we don't. It seems to me that we are no closer to knowing or having a reliable projection than we were two weeks ago or maybe a month and a half ago in February when Dr. Fauci said that this is going to be less impactful than the seasonal influenza or yeah, maybe the January 26th Medicine on February 28th is when he wrote that. and maybe on yeah. uh, January 26th when he went on a New York talk show and said that this is nothing at all for Americans to worry about or maybe years ago uh, with Ebola uh, and I know it's different diseases but this is not spelled out at all it's not necessary to stop air travel it's not necessary to stop uh, quarantines for Ebola, but it is for COVID-19. All of those things, I, I, again, maybe that will all be explained this afternoon, but for right now, it certainly smacks of fake news. I go back to what I said yesterday. I really think I, I, I really would I would love it if you still want to have your bias and ask all questions that are from a critical perspective, fine, but at the very least, you know, Especially because if you look at the communities where this is being primarily waged, it's actually in the kinds of places that watch left America news and voted for Hillary. There's a lot more of this happening to their core audience than to ours. Right? Yes. Okay. So I would imagine their core audience would like some questions answered as well. Instead of sending your political team. Send, they can all hate the president every bit as much as your as your political reporters do, but send your medical reporters instead. All right, send Sanjay Gupta up there to grill Burks and Fauci and Trump with all the same bias, but at least it would be on a on a on a playing field that matters to us. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to what racist what racist trope can we can we can we dilly dally and mentally masturbate to here? Fake racism today. At least send the medical professionals who are left-wing biased, at least send them up to the presser today to ask questions. Then we might actually have a real conversation. Might have a, a real notion of what's really happening. Because so far, all the data that they have given us to justify all this sucks and has been unreliable. That's just the reality. Off the top of my head, I've got most of this memorized. Aaron already gave you a few. We could just go through the entire train of data here. I mean, they literally admitted on, on March 15th, Debbie Burks admitted 
when they launched the 15 days, she admitted that it was or March 17th or 16th when they launched this. They saw the Imperial College survey the day before, the one that's been totally discredited. And that's what prompted them to launch this 15 days. So at least if they sent their biased medical reporters, we'd at least have an argument about stuff that matters to the average American, as opposed to what goes on with these press conferences now. All right, let's go to this next clip from uh, the president explaining why he did this, because he believes he has saved millions of lives. The question I've been asking, a lot of people have been asking, if we didn't shut it down, because I used to say a lot of people said, well, could you just have kept it going? You know, like the flu, like a bad case of the flu, a really bad case. And the answer came in yesterday through Dr. Fauci and th through Deborah Burks. The answer came in, if we did that, in other words, if we just kept the business as usual and didn't do anything to stop it or impede it, uh, could, could have been 2.2 million people could have died. 2.2 million people. Fake news or not, Aaron, you get to go first this time. So unfortunately, this is uh, this is fake news, and it doesn't matter if it was uh, said by the president or anybody else, because this is called the unfalsifiability fallacy. This is the fallacy, the logical fallacy of stipulating something, putting forth an argument that cannot possibly be proven or disproven. How how on earth right. could we possibly prove? Right that these measures actually worked, other than anecdotal evidence, maybe, but there's no possible way for that to be proven true. I'm, I'm sorry, that's just, there's no possible way for that to be proven true. And there's Jordan Schachtel, you can go follow him on Twitter. He's, he's a, a foreign policy guru, but a really, really smart guy. And this is every bit, I mean, this, he and had a pretty a piece, staunch uh, advocate staunch, of the president as well. Exactly. Yes. He has been, he's been following these, the, these um, supposed pieces of research about whether or not social distancing actually works, whether or not forced quarantines actually works. He's got that all documented. You can go follow him on Twitter as well. Jordan Schachtel, and we retweet his stuff all the time. But so there's there's that as well. But this entire notion, this entire notion that uh, we have definitely saved a million lives, 2.2 million. You saw this stipulated by Neil Ferguson from the Imperial College, who's yeah, it's the main, the main. Yeah, the yeah. gaslighting. Yeah. Well, yeah, we saved we saved all of these lives. If we hadn't done this, so uh, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't be seeing what we're seeing now as far as the numbers go. That's called the unfa un unfalsifiability fallacy. And it's complete, complete garbage. What do you think, Todd? It's fake news. I believed it's been fake news for three weeks. Two million, had you done absolutely nothing, two million people weren't going to die. It, you, you believe that this is an entirely different virus than we know it to be, if that's the case. It just, it, there's, there's no there there in terms of that. There is just simply no there there we know within the number of people who infected and how many have to go to the hospital how many have to go to the hospital and how many recover how many die we we know this is not a virus that can and will do that even if we know nothing we know that scientifically we just psychologically though we want it to be something yep. different for any number of reasons and you look again Burks and Fauci, who fact checks them? How do we know they're right all the time? They might be. We don't know. We don't know. I don't know. I think the problem is, is they don't know if they're right. Well, because which time were they right? Exactly. I mean, on Friday, on Thursday and Friday, Debbie Burks took the lead in those press avails, and it was pretty clear that, I mean, she shot down the whole fallacy of the doomsday calculuses. She shot down the New York City's denying people care. and every, She shot every trope down. I mean, it was pretty clear that they were greasing. That she, was, she was clearing the brush for Trump to send the, uh, the economic Navy SEALs in on Monday or Tuesday. It was pretty obvious, right? But what changed in, 20, in 48 hours? What changed? Something might have changed. I don't know what it is. I'm pretty informed on this. I work here full time. Okay. If I don't know what it is, I'd imagine the average American doesn't know. Do you know what it is? No, and that's my no point. No one knows. 
Based on the things we do know, this doesn't make sense. Well, That's they told what we us, know. okay, they might be right, but... When you want me to risk socioeconomic you, ruin, you, I kind of should get to better, vet the people making the recommendation, and shouldn't you I? Sure as hell, better communicate clearly. Uh, Fauci came out there on on CNN, and then later on in the press conference, yeah, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand deaths. And Burks, I, I believe, said as well, two hundred thousand deaths is is the right. Okay, we don't know what the timeline is for that. Is it over the next six months? Right. Is it? Over they can't the even. Next they don't even know how long the virus years? has been here. Uh, Fauci says, uh, you know, millions of cases. How many? millions of cases over what amount of time I, if you can't answer these questions you, we're going to have a real difficult time really difficult time or maybe not maybe not at this rate we're not going to have a difficult time actually cl- complying uh, 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 with everything that they're suggesting and, we comply and with. how many dead worldwide right now i haven't even looked yeah. i haven't even looked at the numbers i've been so focused on what's going on in our own country Here, i could find out what, while you're talking is All it right. What last, is I, it? Is last, it? last I saw it was like 200,000 uh, is what it was um, worldwide. Okay. Dead? Dead is what uh, is, is. Um, no, 40,000. Yeah, it was, I was going to say that. Oh, I'm not, sorry. It's, it's you're definitely right. not 40,735. 40, okay. Uh, it was 200,000 that have recovered. I misread the line. Okay. 40,735 people have died as of two seconds ago. It, and it is overrun the entire world. And large countries and both the East and in the West have basically believed to be late to coming to, uh, to deal with it and are believed to not have done it effectively. Yet you want us to believe that 2 million could die in America when worldwide it's 40,000. You, you can't make me believe that no matter how much fear is inside of you. You cannot make me believe believe that oh you could make me believe that over like 10 years maybe maybe well, can i ask a question that that really needs to be asked i i we're we're i i thought the most important question for the last two weeks is when did the virus get here because how do you flatten a curve if you don't want it started right so we're apparently never going to be given that answer nor is there anybody really anybody else outside of our group of people at places like here at the blaze they're even bothering to ask that question so then I, can i move on to the next big meta question then if we're not going to get an answer to this one to that one all right i think we deserve an answer to this one all right we are today is day 15 What's the incubation period of symptom of, of showing symptoms of this virus? We're, we're told it's roughly 14. what fifteen days yeah. or something okay, like that. Fourteen days is, yeah. the, is the time. All right. So today's fifteen. Day fifteen, we've done these mass shutdowns all across the country. Fourteen days is the incubation period, right? Okay. If indeed you can show me, I'll go by your own graphs. Well, look at the mass spike in cases. They don't ever tell us when we started actually testing for it. Fine. All right. If you then answer this question, riddle me this, Batman. If we're on day 15 of these mass shutdowns and the virus has it, you see where I'm going with this? And the virus has an incubation period of 14 days. And most of this country has been under quarantine for the last 15 days. And the virus has an incubation period of 14 days. Why are we still seeing a spike in cases if we're all still quarantined? Oh, you're doing a terrible job at it. You need to do better or else we're going to keep shutting that's down the, the country. That's the infallibility. Yeah, you, the, the fillet, that's the speed. You're right. That's We're back to again. We, well, we were right. You just didn't do a good enough job. It's, it, it's the same art. It's Afghanistan. It's the welfare state. It's everything. All right. That you're just a racist. You're a misogynist. Uh, if you, There's no reason you'd want a border secure than you just hate Hispanics. It's the same demagoguery. It's day 15 of the shutdowns. It's a 14-day viral incubation period. Why are we still seeing massive spikes in exposures then when everything in America has grinded to a halt? How do you explain that, Erzin? You know what I think, man. There's not a good answer to that one either, by the way. that's a, you know, If I was at the White House press briefing today, that's the question I would ask. Let's get to this final clip here from Newt Gingrich. Sweden has decided to take their seniors and and put them under shelter in place and have continued on as if nothing's wrong while doing the social distancing, uh, but went to work. How close are you watching Sweden? Norway and Denmark are doing what we're doing, but Sweden's doing their own thing. Yeah, so Sweden actually has come closer to what I'm describing. Uh, the Swedes have been very targeted in what they're doing. Uh, the result is their economy is stronger, and they have fewer people infected than either Denmark or Norway. So you can have an intelligent strategy. And look, if you look at Singapore, Taiwan, 
um, South Korea, uh, there's pretty good reason to believe that the right kind of targeted strategy can actually contain the disease while keeping the economy running. Fake news or not? Oh, that's true news. I've been preaching this uh, from the beginning. And the only thing keeping uh, most people from doing it is the the small level of increased risk that most Americans would be taking to go back to work. Apparently, we don't have the guts of Sweden to make that happen. It's pathetic. I, I, I think S- suddenly it's, the leftists yeah. don't want us to become like Sweden. Have you noticed that? I'm, yeah. <laughs> All I've heard most of my career is Sweden socialist. Why can't we? Do you know how suddenly much it, they don't want us to be Sweden? You know how much it sucks when we do not have enough backbone to Annie up at the table with Sweden. Aaron, you were going to say. Yeah, so there is this uh, chart going on, uh, around and going viral this morning about the number of cases in Sweden of coronavirus. And, of course, you know, it's compared to their to their neighbors, but they have, uh, as far as Norway and what's the other one around Sweden? Denmark. Denmark, They have thank twice you. as many people. I, I, yeah, they yeah. have twice as many people. So, of course, they're going to have more cases. I'm trying to look up right now how much testing they're actually doing. But, again, these these you've got to be really careful with graphs because everybody's just using the raw numbers and not contextualizing them uh, versus the other things on the chart that you see. So again, why Who could, needs context? This, is, this has got to be a better thing, I have to imagine, than completely suiciding your economy. No, no, there's no other option. No. Why? Why? Run for your lives. Well, this story has certainly gone viral, gone national. We talked about it uh, during the top of the program. Aaron mentioned it in his montage as well. Uh, Rodney Howard Brown is the name of a pastor in Tampa that most of America probably wasn't aware of 24 hours ago, but many more of us now are because he has been arrested for violating that city's ordinance against mass gatherings by holding his church service at his ministry on Sunday, representing him uh, against those charges as somebody that's been on this show several times over the years. I've known for uh, several years, Matt Staver at Liberty Council. Matt, it's good to have you back with us here on Blaze TV Radio on podcast. How are you, Matt? I'm very good. Thanks to be uh, good to be with you. So, Matt, give us uh, the basic facts of this case as 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 you have learned them and why you agreed to take on uh, defending uh, Pastor Brown. Well, first, we begin looking at the Hillsborough County order that was issued uh, last Friday, the just before the weekend. And that order has 42 paragraphs of exceptions for a whole laundry list of companies and businesses, some that you might think, but others Hold on, you, you said wouldn't 40, even I'm sorry, Matt, 42 paragraphs of exceptions? 42 paragraphs of exceptions. And if you don't meet one of those 42 paragraphs, and by the way, Steve, in each one of the paragraphs are multiple exemptions. So it's 42 paragraphs, each paragraph, some of which are filled with multiple exemptions. Wow. And if you don't meet any one of those 42, then there's a catch-all paragraph that says any business that doesn't fall in one of those 42 plus categories, as long as you can operate with a six foot separation between people, no cap on the number of people in your business, then you can operate, no problem. The only ones that can't are churches. So if you wanna have like in Various uh, people have told us the Walmarts or the K- the uh, Home Depots, for example, in Hillsborough County, they look like a rock band is there. Yeah. It's a rock concert because yeah. they're filled with people and uh, they're buying essential things like plants for their potted gardens. And uh, yet they don't have the six foot separation. And that's what this church did. The church complied with it. On its face, it's not exempted. But the church was operating like all these other secular businesses have this exemption. So they required at the beginning of the entrances, everyone to use hand sanitizers, all the staff wore gloves, and each person was required to have a six foot separation in their farmer's market that's inside the lobby where they were giving away food. They had the floor marked for six feet inside their sanctuary. They have movable chairs. So they moved the chair so that it was a fraction of the size and they required a six foot separation. The only people that were in close proximity were families that arrived together. Everybody else had to have a six foot separation. And then they bought $100,000 worth of high grade hospital uh, air purifiers uh, that are highly rated for uh, 
killing and uh, stopping microbes, even including some of the microbes within the coronavirus family. It went above and beyond what any secular business did. And yet this share uh, ran to a press conference at one o'clock. And get this, this is a second degree misdemeanor, Steve. It's not even a first degree. It is punishable. The maximum punishment is two months in jail, $500 fine. I mean, that may be a, a medium level traffic violation, mm. for example. And how many people are um, confronted with sheriff deputies at their home when they're willing to come in voluntarily and while the deputies are at your house there is a press conference taking place about your arrest. It was an attempt by the sheriff to shame the pastor and intimidate pastors. Mm -hmm. And the sheriff actually invited uh, a pastor to come and speak. He had no idea it was about his friend Rodney Howard Brown. He was just called to come to speak at a press conference regarding coronavirus. And he had another person who was a pastor who was also a member of the city council. He began lecturing people about what the Bible says. And then the county attorney also quoted from Mark chapter 12, verse 31, uh, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. So all this theology was coming from the sheriff's platform uh, while this pastor, who uh, amazingly two weeks ago was named um, one of the honorary deputies of the Orange County. He actually has his deputy badge, and he was going to be a chaplain for the uh, Hillsborough County um, Department. Uh, so it, it's incredible the circus that was created by this sheriff in this unconstitutionally applied order that exempts every secular gathering you can imagine, except for churches. I think, boy, there's there's so many distinctions you've drawn that I think we need to go back and highlight. But I think the the main one here, Matt, is that you don't have a constitutional right to own a Lowe's. Right. You don't have a you don't have a constitutional right, right to it, it, Costco doesn't have a constitutional right to purchase land and force you and, 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 and run a business. Right. They don't. OK. Right. But that church ministry does have that kind of constitutional uh, th that sort of constitutional assumed protection. Basically, let's go with that phrase and assumed yeah. preference protection because of the First Amendment. And yet. That was completely disregarded to make an example out of Rodney Brown while they granted all these exceptions to businesses that don't have a presumed constitutional protection. That's exactly right. You know, in Orange County, where Orlando is, uh, a similar order was issued about a week ago. But that particular order exempts churches. It encourages churches to comply with CDC guidelines, but it's an advisory opinion churches are exempted as they should be under the First Amendment. The First Amendment is there in the first position for a reason. It gives this heightened constitutional protection, not to run a Lowe's, as you said, or a Home Depot, as good as they are, there's not a constitutional right. If somebody doesn't allow you to build a Lowe's or own a Lowe's, you don't have a constitutional violation. But if it's a church, you do. And they have They've allowed the the you can buy a uh, you can buy pot in um, Hillsborough County. You can buy a potted plant. You can have an abortion, but and you can operate commercial businesses all you want as long as you have the six foot separation. Even uh, if you're not exempted, if you're exempted, you don't even need the six foot separation. But you can't have a church service no matter what you do to comply with health standards to protect your people. They have deemed them persona non gratis. They have deemed them absolutely non-essential and they have no exceptions for church gatherings. I know when you get to a, a hot button issue like this, Matt, and you know this too, because you're not just an attorney, but you, you've, you've been politically active. So you know how emotions of situations like right. this can run with things, right? And, and right. you know, people want to immediately jump to the conversation of whether a church, churches should be pushing this, whether that sets the right example. That to me, that's a separate conversation, okay? And, and th that is a conversation I think people can, of good conscience can be on differing sides of trying to do some kind of a, um, of a, of a calculus about what, about the a church's role uh, in the community and a, and a message that it sends in terms of the pure legality here, what clearly it was shown by the, the, the sheriff's office there in Tampa is that they view the church as an, an institutional level 
as one that they that that they can control and is not as essential into the lives of people as going to Walmart or Home Depot or Lowe's. And if that precedent is allowed to be established in a time like this, then why wouldn't they why why wouldn't a sheriff who knows not Joseph later on, Matt, d- decide, you know, we don't really think that you ought to be preaching out of Romans 1 or Leviticus. And because of that, you know, we're just, we think that's a health, that we think that's a hazard to the community. We got a gay rights uh, parade that's a huge boon to our local economy. And, and you drive, you know, some of those potential customers, right? If It's the legal principle that's being applied here. If the institution that has a presumed constitutional, pre-existing constitutional protection, if it can be infringed upon in ways that commercial businesses that don't have those protections are not currently if it can be done now then why can't it because of this virus then why can't it be done later if government deems steve, it so yeah steve i mean you you hit the point right on the head this is the real issue i did a statement last week that liberty is the long term uh, or the loss of liberty i should say is the long term crisis that we face it's obviously even in the short term because we're facing it now but the precedent that we set right now if we just simply say it's okay you can have any commercial secular meeting what you can do is your own business you just have to maybe comply with this or that kind of separation or maybe size limitation in some cases but if you're a church and you want to talk about religious things Jesus, you want to come up to Easter and celebrate Easter, you can't do it. Why? Because we have deemed you to not have one scintilla of value to the community. We won't even allow you to try to operate on the same basis as these other commercial secular programs. You just must shut down. How long are we going to shut down? You're going to shut down as long as we want you to shut down. Mm -hmm. So just be quiet and shut down. And if they can do that now, Steve, under these circumstances, they can do it under any other circumstances, including some of those examples that you named. That's the real problem that we face here. It's a serious threat to our constitutional freedom. I had had uh, an elder at another church send me an email this morning in another state. And he does. They don't they're not trying to cause a publicity stunt. OK, so I'm not going to name them. Uh, and, but um, they they he, they asked uh, they asked their local law enforcement, what if we just had people come and park six feet away from each other in the park? Meaning they're trying to figure out what's the boundary right. here. Right. What if we just came and parked six feet apart in the parking lot? All right. Is that are we are we now violating your ordinance? And then finally, the, the local law enforcement officer said to him, aren't you concerned about the kind of message that, or th- that you're sending the community and the way people will perceive you? Well, with all due respect to that member of law enforcement, that's a valid question. That's not his jurisdictional authority. If he would, like, right. if he would like to debate that, you know, run for a legislative office. OK, his job as the as local law enforcement is to enforce the, the 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 Constitution of the United States and the laws therein. So to offer his opinion on the branding of the church is irrelevant. He, the, he, he's being asked a legal question. The fact right. that that he would just jump to that assumption. I mean, it's like everybody thinks they're an unelected judge now. Matt. They, anybody just thinks I can just yeah. go do any, anything I want because something must be done. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, I mean, we have this situation in Texas where a pastor contacted us and he has been doing the drive-in type of theater in the parking lot. He has recently been told that you have to stop it. Why? Not because he has any problem, but because some other church may not have complied with what they said you should do. And so you have to shut down. In Washington state, we have a pastor with a music um, minister and a sound technician, three people, told you can't even leave your home to go to the church to do the online broadcast uh, so that you must stay at home. Um, I mean, it becomes absolutely ridiculous. We have a situation, not a church in Wisconsin, where a person, they have a 10 person um, limitation in, in that particular executive order. And on their own private property, they were outside with more than five, but less than 10 people. Uh, playing some Christian music with a guitar. Uh, It was uh, the family and a friend came over. They were told by law enforcement to disperse because the law enforcement is now saying it has to be five or under, which is not what the executive order says, and it has to be people that are only um, blood relatives. So you're starting to see everyone get into this act. 
Uh, governors, mayors, they're issuing these orders. They're not constitutionally vetted. They're not debated by the legislature. They're not in having input from the people. And then they just throw them out there and give you almost zero warning and boom, they expect you to order your lives accordingly. It's very disruptive. And, and frankly, we need to have some order that comes to this process rather than this frantic rush to get out and order and the bulldoze not bulldozing in terms of striking down the buildings, but basically bulldozing the, the churches underground, putting them underground except for online services, while letting uh, a plethora of other companies operate with very little restrictions. Matt, I've got only about two minutes here. There's one more thing I want to ask you about, because the other side of this is we're seeing from some, I'm seeing from other believers in my own audience, seeing this from other Christian leaders on my social media. I think there is a concern that pushing this right now during coronavirus may create the avenue for further intrusions on religious liberty that we know, frankly, a large, at least one major political party and a whole, uh, and, and, and a whole group of uh, people in America would like to do anyway. Okay. And so don't push this right now because that will give them the political standing to essentially erase our religious freedom later on. What would you, what would you say to those people that have that point of view? I, I certainly respect their view. I have an opposite view that if you don't say something, if you just go and remain silent and you're willing to accept this discriminatory treatment, it sets a bad precedent. You know, Martin Luther King Jr., when he was in the Birmingham jail, was asked the same question, not now, Martin, not now. And he said, how long are we going to wait? The question is, where is the end in sight? It doesn't seem to be getting any better. It seems to be getting worse. And we need to come up with more rational, uh, constitutional ways that we deal with this rather than these haphazard, sloppy executive orders that literally shut the doors of the churches with no opportunity for them to meet under any circumstances. Matt, if there's anybody that uh, in our audience right now that uh, may end up needing help from an organization like yours, how can they find you? They can go to our website, Steve. It's lc.org, just two letters, lc.org. Our phone number's there, our email's there. You can contact us, again, lc.org. Matt Saver from Liberty Council. Good to see you, brother. As always, take Good care. God bless. Steve. All right. Thank you. You bet. Gentlemen, your thoughts on that conversation we just had with Matt Staver. Well, you know, I was one of those people when we debated this. I, was it a, a week ago? Yeah. I, th yeah. I said, well, we have to consider that in the in the short term. I don't remember if I put a window on it, but I was thinking of the Trump 15 days. I can go yeah. 15 days, but not with Easter coming. I'm telling you, if you aren't willing on Easter Sunday... If the uh, if if the situation presents itself uh, along the lines of things that must be stood for, if you're not willing to get rested for your faith on Easter Sunday, man, I just you got some serious questions to ask for yourself. And I, listen, you shouldn't be looking for that to happen. Right. But right now, yeah, the, the, now that the 15 days is over here, we need to ask all of these bigger questions that Matt Saver said. This is a fight that must be had. It's not an option for you, quite frankly. Yes. And to make this clear, I mean, this should be along the lines of what Todd was saying. This is, well, I, I'll just say this. This should be, this is, I, I think, in the best viewed in the lens of what the threat is to the Constitution, of, of what our, our, our rights are and the, the rights that we've been blessed with here in the United States. Um, I mean, God's church is going to live on, regardless of what some podunk uh, punk sheriff in, uh, in, in in Tampa says. All right. So this is that guy. Do you think that guy, that guy poses a real threat to the church? No, he doesn't. What he does pose is a threat to the Constitution. And that's the conversation. And I think that's the context that these conversations have to be had with them. We're going to stick around and do some overtime for our Blaze TV subscribers, blazetv.com, uh, promo code Steve, and get $30 off your subscription right now, blazetv.com, promo code Steve, $30 off, cheapest price we've ever had. Uh, for the rest of you, we will see you again tomorrow right here on Blaze TV Radio and Podcast.